Snow science, understanding what causes avalanches, is a perfect model for understanding how science works. So science is what? A way of knowing. Science is a way of knowing things. And that process, a scientific process, if you remember, first thing is you start off with a question. Our question today is, what causes avalanches, right? Second thing is they want to experiment and make observations. Third thing would be um, record your observations. So if I'm a snow scientist and I heard there's an avalanche up here at Tony Grove, I'm going to come up here with a bunch of tools and I'm going to measure everything I can and I'm going to write it down. Fourth step in that, once you've written your observations down, is you're going to look for what? Patterns. Okay. Look for patterns in your data. And so if I'm a snow scientist and I'm, I'm looking at the aspect of the slope, which direction, if we're looking at this little slope right here, which direction does this slope face? iPad okay. compass. Okay. It'd be calibrated now. So it's pointing north is coming right that direction. So this slope then faces what direction according to the compass? North is that way, right? So it's facing north, basically. So we'll call it a north-facing slope. So here's our snow pit we've dug up here at Tony Grove. We have 65 centimeters of snow. And we've just inserted some thermometers to look at the temperature in the snow at the different levels. But if we take a paintbrush, this is our new snow that fell last night right on top. And we come down, you can see this is all pretty soft snow and it starts to get harder and we've got can you see how soft that layer is right there there's two of them sandwiched between a little harder layer right there we'll continue coming down this snow is quite a bit harder but there's another weak layer right in there showing another one right there okay and looks like a last one down there so these layers here this is a history of our snowpack. Each layer there, this was our first snowstorm before Thanksgiving. That snow's been compacted really deep. Okay, these are our next storms. Um, each one of these soft layers is a weak layer, and those can be caused in a number of ways we'll talk about. So checking our temperatures, we had negative 8 degrees at the top, negative 8 degrees in the middle, and negative 4 degrees at the bottom. So our snowpack is warmest um, down at the bottom. Why would that be? Any ideas? Do Where do Eskimos live? The coldest place. What do they build for houses traditionally? Um, igloos, igloos, right? Why? Why would you build an igloo? To be warm. To be warm. Snow is actually an insulator. So all this snow is insulating the little bit of warmth that's just residue from the ground. The earth has a little bit of heat. Not a lot here, but it's not going to be below zero, right? So a lot of times on a cold day, especially the warmest temperature is going to be at the bottom of the snowpack. It will be different, however, if we have a really warm day and the sun is beating on the top of the snow. Where do you think the warmest temperature would be? On top. On top. So there's three different ways heat can be transferred from one place to another, and we have all three of those at work here in our snowpack. Radiation is like little teeny bullets of heat that come from the sun to the earth, they travel in a perfectly straight line. Those can come down and hit the snow. A lot of them will be reflected because snow is what color? White. White. If snow was black, more irradiation would be absorbed, right? Because black absorbs all colors of light. White reflects all colors. So you can get radiation can enter the snowpack as one type of heat transfer. Second kind is conduction. Right now, Anybody feeling cold? Like if you put your hand in the snow, is your hand going to get cold? Yeah. That's conduction when something's touching and heat is transferred either to or away from it. Okay. Um, so if we get radiation hitting the surface and it melts some snow and that warmer water trickles down through the snowpack, that can warm up some of these weak layers by conduction. Okay. Um, third type of heat transfer is convection currents, and that's the idea that warm air or water slowly rises. The reason these areas here, those layers we um, exposed with the paintbrush are showing, why they're soft is they were formed in really cold conditions. So there's not any free moisture. 
and these layers, these weak layers are preventing the layers on top from sticking together, okay? And that's what creates a avalanche danger. This is a cool tool that I have for our next part of this experiment. This will measure, this scale here will measure how much water is in this tube. Is there any water in there right now? No. No water in there. Anyone got a water bottle we can pour some in? No. Will that work? Why? Because no. it has a hole. Yeah, the water will go right out. So if there's no water in here right now, what should it say when I put it on the scale right now? Nothing. It should say zero. This is called calibrating our scale. So I put it on there. Can you see that on the video there? Yeah. What does it say? Zero. Zero. So is our scale accurate? It's yeah. calibrated. Okay. So what this allows us to do then is take a sample of, remember I talked about our greatest snow on earth? Snow falls about 10 to 12 percent water here in Utah. Mm -hmm. That's our new snow with some old snow. We've got just a couple centimeters of new snow and it settles over time. But what's that reading right there? Can you guys see that? About 13. Right there, Yeah, it's closer to 15 percent today. That top layer has done some settling. So in your journals, for the top layer, write 15% water. So if we had 10 inches of snow at 15% density, we would have how much water in the pot if we melted it? 15% of 10 would be, we'd have an inch and a half of water. Okay. We want our highest density layers on the top or on the bottom for stable conditions? On top. The highest density with the most water we want at the bottom. Okay. Oh. So we're going to take another sample right here from the middle. Okay. And can you see in the end there how it's not quite full? Yeah. So that's telling us mm, we're not going to get an accurate sample. So we try again. Try over on this side. Oh, that one's looking better. A little tiny bit more in there. Okay. And we'll throw this on the scale. What's the percentage of water here? Can you see that? 22. 22, 23. Okay, so right, 22% water for our next layer. So that's a pretty good increase. If we had 10 inches of snow at this level and melted it, we'd have just over 2 inches of water in the pot. And our last one down here, did you hear how much harder that was? Yeah. What do you think that's going to mean for a our sample? A little more. A lot more. A lot more? Wait. Now that's the snow at the bottom. This is the snow that fell at Thanksgiving, so it's been compacted by all these other storms. And what does that say? 30, 30, 30 31. Okay, so let's write 31% water. So the snow at the bottom of our snowpack right now has twice the water in it that the snow at the top does. Trying to figure out what all this means, what we've looked at here. We found some weak layers in the snowpack. We've talked about how you know, snow scientists will call this stuff sugar snow. Can you film that right there? You can see how it looks like sugar. Yeah. It's the kind of snow, I can't make a snowball out of it. It doesn't want to stick together because it's too dry. There's no moisture. So for those weak layers to um, become strong layers, to allow these this layer of snow to stick to this layer, we need some heat to get in there. It's either got to come from radiation and then percolating snow or convection currents coming up from the bottom to put some moisture in there to allow those snow crystals to stick together. So our question is, what does all this mean from an avalanche perspective? Well, if we do a little simple experiment here, I, I take my saw, you can turn over here, my snow saw, I'm going to cut down and listen carefully, you'll hear when we get to that ice layer. Can you hear it? Yeah. And then you'll see... It's soft right there. Did you see how much faster the saw went down? Yeah. So I have a column of snow here, but it's still connected to the back. And then I'm going to take my shovel and put it back here. And I'm just going to see. Now, I've done this before right here and had the whole thing slide. Okay. Remember when I showed you the avalanche advisory for today? For this time, it's pretty low hazard everywhere in the Bear River Mountains. Okay, I'm down to that ice layer. And I'm just pushing on my shovel. Anything happening? Okay, we're not getting any movement anywhere here, are we? Mm -hmm. So that's a good sign. I'm beating on that pretty hard. 
I'm going to come down through the ice layer now. Okay, we got a failure right down here in that weak layer. See that soft snow? And if I take this, turn it upside down, boom, that's the weak layer. This is that sugar snow. Can you see that? Yeah. Doesn't want to make a snowball. I can't pack it together. That's the weak layer right there where I got a failure. Now this isn't tons of stress on that weak layer, and it's not a horribly bad weak layer going on right here. But when we get another, say we got two feet of pretty warm snow, a lot of weight on that, this will be a problem, and you'll read about that in the news. That's one test we can do. I had to apply a lot of pressure to get that to slide though, so it's still fairly stable. Put this in our snow junkyard, and we'll do one more test here. So I'm gonna actually cut the back of the column this time. Hear the ice layer? Yeah. Cut, cut, cut. And then I'm going to cut the side here. And this is called a compression test. And what this test is trying to accomplish is if we isolate a column of snow here and put some weight on it, what will happen to that column of snow? Will we get a failure or not? So we've identified our weak layers. I put my shovel on. Skier comes along. Did anything happen down there? I'm looking at those weak layers. Am I getting a failure? Yeah. Okay, that time, I don't know if you saw it broke on that lowest weak layer again. Yeah. All those others are just kind of compacting this. Okay, we got all this loose snow here. But again, our second test showed us a failure on that same weak layer, and there's that sugar snow once again. Doesn't want to make a snowball, does it? So what needs to happen for that weak layer to go away? We need that weak layer to warm up somehow so it'll start to bond the two layers together like glue. Any questions so far on this today? Okay.